turkey for me. <laughs> turkey for you. Let's eat the turkey in my big brown shoe. I will believe in myself and my ability to do my best. I will think, I will listen, I will participate in my own success. I will encourage others, I will act respectfully, I will show kindness, I will make AJB the place to be. Yeah. The year is 1942. The Second World War is at its height, and since Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, American strikes on outposts in the Pacific have increased. Japanese and German forces were tapping into American military communication lines intently, but their decrypting methods weren't yielding any results anymore. Why? All messages were being encrypted by Navajo code talkers. Arizona, Arizona. You see, codifying messages is standard practice during wartime. What wasn't standard practice was ciphering a Native American language that had no written alphabet to begin with. Navajo was one such language. You're watching Explore Mode, and today we're learning about Navajo code talkers. First things first, what are code talkers? Well, code talkers were people recruited by the military during wartime to encrypt messages using a little known language. The term is usually used in reference to Native American code talkers who served in both the Second and First World War transmitting tactical messages using an encoded version of their native tongue. The first Amerindian language used as code in the First World War was Choctaw, the language of a Native American tribe originally from the southeastern United States. Nineteen Choctaw soldiers joined American infantry forces and passed on messages using their native tongue. The language was so foreign to enemy forces that stories tell of Germans tapping into American communications and thinking that they were using a special device to record their voices underwater. But by the time the Second World War came, many Japanese scholars had already studied Native American languages, so the U.S. had to think of other options. That's where Philip Johnston comes in. The story goes that Philip Johnston, the son of missionaries who worked in a Navajo reservation, was flipping through the pages of a newspaper when he saw that American troops were looking for newer and harder to decipher Native American language-based code. They were already working with Comanches, Choctaws, Hopis, Cherokees, among other Native American languages. Having grown up listening and speaking Navajo, Johnson knew it was the perfect language to encrypt the Marine Corps' messages. Why? At the time, Navajo was an unwritten language, which means there was no alphabetical representation of its sounds. That made it almost impossible to transliterate. It could only be interpreted by native speakers. The recruitment process was complicated. The Marine Corps had to find Navajo men who were both bilingual and met the physical requirements to join them. Some code talkers volunteered to participate in the program. Others were drafted, and many falsified documents because they were underage, some as young as 15. Apart from participating in boot camp, the men had to develop the code themselves. Literal translations were useful but easier to decipher, so they had to come up with a new method. The Marine Corps decided to use substitution instead. There were two types of codes, Type 2 codes and Type 1 codes. Type 2 codes were direct translations. Type 1 codes worked with substitution. Coders assigned a Navajo word for each letter of the alphabet and spelled out entire messages to each other. So for example, spelling out the word code would work like this. They replaced the letter C with mosi, the Navajo word for cat. The letter O was replaced with nesja, 
the Navajo word for owl. The D would be tle chae, or dog in Navajo. And E would be zhe, or elk in Navajo. Mo si ne sha tle chae zhe, code. They also created special code words for certain implements of war. For example, the code word for a patrol plane was gagi, or crow in Navajo. A minesweeper was called cha'a, the Navajo word for beaver. One of the reasons that made Navajo a difficult language to decipher, apart from the fact that very few people spoke it at the time, is the fact that it's a tonal language. That means that differences in pitch and inflection can change the meaning of a word. Navajo has four tones for its vowels, low, high, rising, and falling. Other tonal languages in the world include Chinese, Vietnamese, and Thai. The Navajo code talkers memorized all substitutions during training, and according to the CIA, they were able to encode, send, and decode a message in just two minutes during drills. The Navajo code had proven to be a success. Roughly 400 Navajos participated in the code talker program, and their efforts were key to the success of Allied forces in crucial moments, such as the Battle of Iwo Jima, where they sent over 800 messages back and forth without a single mistake. Major Howard Connor, who was the signal officer of the code talkers at Iwo Jima, is quoted as saying, Were it not for the Navajos, the Marines would never have taken Iwo Jima. Joey Kiyomiya was a Navajo soldier fighting in the Philippines when Japan took over in 1942. He was captured and imprisoned. Once the Japanese figured out he was Navajo, they sent him to a prison in Japan and demanded him to try to decode the messages they had intercepted. But it was impossible. Kiyomiya spoke Navajo, but he wasn't trained in Navajo code. To him, the messages were as confusing as they were to the Japanese. Of course, his captors were not pleased with his performance. Kiyomiya endured months of torture, but he not only survived life as a POW in Japan, he also survived the Bataan Death March and the bombing of Nagasaki. Kiyomiya is quoted as saying, I salute the code talkers, and even if I knew about their code, I wouldn't tell the Japanese. The code talkers returned to America quietly. No one but their peers knew of the critical role they played in the war, mainly because the program remained classified until 1968. Up until that time, the code was still used to relay classified information during the Korean and Vietnam War. The first public recognition of the code talkers would come decades later in 2001, when then-President George W. Bush held a ceremony honoring 21 code talkers with gold and silver medals. Three of the remaining code talkers were honored again in 2017 by President Donald Trump. The Navajo Nation today extends 27,673 square miles, covering areas in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. 250,000 Navajo people live in it, and they have their own flag and presidential elections. According to a 2010 census, 170,000 people speak Navajo in their homes. However, many fear the language will eventually be replaced by English, as the number of fluent speakers is dwindling. As for code talkers, few are still alive today, but their legacy and their service will live on. Today's trivia is over Chester Nez. Chester Nez was born in New Mexico on the Navajo Reservation in 1921. Nez's family owned a large herd of 1,000 sheep and were economically and emotionally devastated when the federal government killed 700 of their sheep during an enforced livestock reduction program in the 1930s. Nez then spent several years at a boarding school in Fort Defiance, where he faced abusive treatment. Students were punished, often physically, for speaking in Navajo. They were generally treated in a degrading manner and, and being encouraged to forget the traditional teachings from their families. While in high school, a Marine Corps recruiter came looking for Navajo men. World War II was ongoing and the government needed men. Chester decided to join in order to get off the reservation and to see the world. Nez was a part of the first all-Navajo platoon at the Marine Corps boot camp a group of 29 men who became known as the first 29 code talkers. These 29 men skillfully created a code that was complex enough so the Japanese were unable to break it 
even after torturing Navajo POWs from army units, yet simple and logical enough that it could be memorized by hundreds of other code talkers. Nez was conflicted about creating the code because the government wanted to use a language he was physically punished for speaking. He hoped by creating the code, people would learn that everyone's culture has value. After creating the Navajo code and committing it to memory, Nez and most of the other first 29 were rushed out to units in the South Pacific. Nez and other code talkers with the 1st and 2nd Marine Divisions rapidly won the confidence of their commanders. Combat was a somber and sobering experience for Nez, as he survived attacks and never got used to the sight of dead bodies. While his experiences were stressful, the camaraderie he felt with his fellow Marines helped him get through, as did traditional Navajo prayers he said on a daily basis. Upon returning home with no fanfare, the code talkers were classified information for 20 years. They were not allowed to speak about what they did or experienced, and no one was aware of their contributions to the success of winning the war. After the war, Chester struggled with symptoms of post-traumatic stress, but reported that the enemy way ceremony held for him was effective and for him to heal. The enemy way is a traditional Navajo ceremony performed to returning combat veterans to help them process their experience, reintegrate into society, and restore balance to their life. As one of the first 29 code talkers who devised the Navajo code, Chester Nez was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in 2001. Chester Nez passed away June 2014 at the age of 93. Today's question is, Chester Nez was famous for doing what during World War II? Make sure you add your first and last name, your grade level, and the answer. Have a great Friday. Nichts ha ja ash de hon loni, nige di in go olzen le. Benohol nihi, nasko ke a yil jish le. Ado be i ninizini, t a ya ash de anilhiki it ego. Nahasan bakhagi a nih le. Chian t a quije, naha yil sodigi, dije naha na de na a. Ado a nichich in, bahagi a da nichli, ba yo a da hidit a hagi it ego, nich in, in da yil zihigi, nacha, yo a hida a, a do nichi, hodeno trachin, nichi ortli lago, in da bahagi it a, bits aji, is da nichi yinil, hala, o hoyel ago, nit a no hodni, a do, t a ro be no zilata, in da a yo ant e, uh, Hi, JB family. Hi, JB. We are hoping that you guys are ready for this upcoming week. We hope that um, you guys rest your mind and your bodies and uh, reflect on what you are thankful for. Spend some time with your family. And we're going to share with you now some videos that some of our students and staff have recorded about what they're thinking about this Thanksgiving holiday and what they're thankful for. Happy Thanksgiving! Happy Thanksgiving! For this year, I am thankful for um, everyone in this, in this basically this whole school. Yeah. Adios, a por tener trabajo, salud, a mis hijos, a mis papás, a ustedes. Ah, gracias. Okay, Mr. Val, what does Thanksgiving mean to you? Thanksgiving is a time where uh, we get together. I have a huge family and we get together and we just spend time together. I'm looking forward to actually doing that this year. Um, it feels like we haven't been together as a family in a long time due to COVID. So I'm really looking forward to seeing grandkids and cousins and um, my parents and my sisters and brothers. So that's what I'm thankful for this year. Mr. Adiola, what are you thankful for this year? At AGB this year, I'm thankful for having the world's best teachers and the world's best students. Guys, thank you very much for making AGB the place to be. I wish you an awesome and great fall break. I am thankful for my family and my friends. Hey, Ms. Valencia, what are you thankful for this year? I'm thankful for my family and all the kiddos here at AGB that I get to work with. What are you thankful for this year? My 
family and my new job here at Sabine ISD. What are you thankful for this year? I'm thankful for my family and my friends and the people that I spend time with. What are you thankful for? My family and my friends and food. What are you thankful for this year? You know, I'm thankful for games and well, food. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I'm thankful for my uh, family and my friends because we started a business. Oh, wow. And we all help each other work on it. What are you thankful for? Friends and family. <laughs> I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful, I'm thankful for my grandma. Kennedy, what are you thankful for this year? I am thankful for good health for all of my students and my family and a nice long Thanksgiving break. What are you guys thankful for? I'm thankful for my family and my friends. I'm thankful for Thanksgiving break. <laughs> what are you thankful for? Life. Yeah. Hello, my name is Yimo Gonzalez. I'm in grade six. I'm thankful for having parents and what they do for me and how they support me. Hi, I'm Melody Gonzalez, and I'm thankful for my parents being there for me every time I need them. I'm Kayla, and I'm thankful for my family and my pets and everything else. My name is Sebastian Molina, I'm in 6th grade, and I'm thankful for my family and my baby sister. Okay. My name's Landon, I'm in 6th grade, and I'm thankful for the food. Um, my name is Maya, and I'm in 6th grade, and I'm thankful for my mom. So, I'm in 6th grade, my name is Jaden Lopez, and uh, I'm thankful for my family and friends. My name is Roger. I am thankful for my family for Thanksgiving. I'm in sixth grade, and then my family. I'm thankful for them for making good food. I'm thankful for them for being my parents and brothers and sisters. Hi, my name is Blaze, and I am in sixth grade. I am thankful for my parents and my cousins. Okay. My name is Damira and I'm in sixth grade. What I'm thankful for is the planet because without it, we all wouldn't exist. I'm John and I'm in sixth grade and I'm thankful for my family. Uh, my name is Javen. I'm in sixth grade and I'm thankful for my PS4. Awesome. Okay. My name is Santiago and I'm uh, sixth grade and I'm thankful. I'm thankful for everything that I have in my life. What are you guys thankful for? I